you have a practice or are you running a business? Valuation is the ultimate KPI. Hey there, it's Mike Langford. Welcome to another episode of the Modern Financial Advisor Podcast brought to you by Truelytics by InvestNet. This week on the show, I have Mark Gochner, Head of Advisor Services at Dimensional Fund Advisors with me for a fascinating conversation about some of the discoveries he and his team have made about client preferences and behaviors. Now, I feel like we're on a roll lately with having several industry leaders come on the show to share the findings of their surveys. And Mark really brought the thunder in this episode. One thing that I think you'll find that really jumps out is how Mark translates the survey results into actionable steps for you and your business. My favorite one is when Mark shares how early stage advisors, so-called Generation 3 and G4 advisors, can help develop their presence with high net worth clients. It's really fascinating stuff. You're absolutely going to love it. Okay, before we get to the conversation with Mark, please make sure you subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Amazon, the YouTubes, or wherever you like to get your podcast jam on. And if you have a question or a suggestion for a guest or a topic for the show, hit us up. Simply go to truelytics.com and use that little connect form there or shoot us an email, podcast at truelytics.com. We would love to hear from you. Okay, let's get to the conversation with Mark Gockner. Mark Gochner, welcome to the Modern Financial Advisor Podcast. So wonderful to see you today. It is fantastic to be here. Uh, absolutely, Mike. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. You know, I'm kind of a little mad at myself because you're in Austin. I'm in Austin. We could be right together hanging out, <laughs> having beers, you know, just doing what Austin guys do, beer, tacos, barbecue, whatever. So uh, next time, absolutely in person. Yeah, we can still do that uh, for sure. Um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, for, we'll do a before and after. We'll do a podcast without it and one with it, and we'll see which one people like more. I tell you what, I guarantee you they will even like the ones with beers more because I've done a lot of podcasts and videos over the years when we've been having recreational beverages. Always more fun. <laughs> so, anyway, all right. Well, listen, I wanted to dive in. I'm so thrilled that you and the team suggested some of the topics for today's show because I think they're they're – they're so insightful for our audience, the modern financial advisor, right? You and the team at, at DFA are constantly studying advisors. And in fact, a couple of years ago, I had Catherine Williams, the, the head of practice management at DFA on the team. And she um, talked about the value of benchmarking for financial advisors. And it was a really fascinating conversation that shined a light on how advisors can improve their business by learning from the peers, right? I thought that was really cool. <laughs> So today, we're going to dive a little deeper with some fresh, actionable insights. So let's kick things off with some of what you have learned from your global investor study, which looks at the world from the perspective of the clients of advisors. I think this is a really good like, way of like, spinning things around. Like, How are the clients seeing the world? So let's, let's dive in. I oh, love it. Yeah. And thank you for the kind words there. It's something we, we can talk about this stuff all day long and, and love it. And you know, let me just go back to you mentioned that we call it the global advisor study, uh, mm. where, you know, over the years, uh, we're just working with various advisors around the world, really, we'd get the questions, hey, what are you seeing other firms doing that's working really well? Yeah. What are you seeing firms doing that maybe it's not working so well? And we said, well, let's just formalize that with some real data that we can share with, with the clients we work with. And so we started that. We call it the Global Advisor Study. I think we just wrapped up our 12th or entered our 12th year of that one. And then probably about five years ago, the advisor said, you know, I love what you're doing on the advisor side. I'd love to understand more about our clients, the investors. Yeah. And so we launched the Global Investor Study, which you just referred to. And, you know, the whole goal there is just, you know, what can we do to better understand the clients of the advisors? What can we do to better understand the client experience they're looking for so we can all go out there and deliver a better experience and ultimately, you know, provide a better experience for the investors as well as prospects coming in down the road. So, you know, we learned a lot. Some of this stuff, it just confirms the things you're doing. Uh, some of the things that challenge you as well of how do we think about continuing to evolve the client experience? So quick question, like, kind of like to set the stage a little more so that I think the, the audience understands the study and, and, and the people that are in it a little better. Is this a broad range, like spanning the whole spectrum from early stage investors, right? Clients who are like, you know, really kind of getting their investment journey going and more mature and then, and then maybe in the, in the high net worth and ultra high net worth. Are you kind of looking at different segments as well? Or is it, or is it kind of like one universe? 
It, it turns out to be a little bit of everybody in terms okay. of tenure, the relationship with the advisor, as well as ages, as well as various size of, of investable assets. And so what we do is we open it up to the advisors. It's up to them to participate in however shape or form they want to. They can send it to all the clients. They can segment it uh, by certain clients. They have multiple offices. They can segment it so they can see the responses from one office compared to another office, which I think is incredibly important because you know it's so important to think about your consistency of brand uh, right. across the advisors, across offices, if you are in more of a national type of firm. But what we get then is we don't get any client information and we don't want it at all. Right. It's, a, it's an anonymous study. So the investors are free to answer it however they so choose. But we do ask them some demographic questions because that's really important. And that's what we want to do is understand, do you see some variation in terms of yeah. investors by size of assets, by their ages, perhaps, how long they've worked with a particular advisor? One of the things we have asked, uh, interestingly enough, is now, did you work with advisor before you started working with your current advisor? And I think the answer was about 40% or so. Um, actually, I did not, never had an advisor before. So that's kind of interesting. interesting data, as well as you think about maybe the type of language you use with a prospect, because they may not have ever had an advisor. That's probably a very different conversation, perhaps, than somebody who has had an advisor relationship already. So we got quite a bit of information on demographics. We break the study up into a couple major themes. Part of it is, how do you think about investing generally? What kind of relationship do you want with your advisor in terms of how often do you want to meet? What is it you want to talk about when mm. you do get together? And then how do you measure the value of the relationship, the, the value you're getting from your advisor? So really, really in interesting information there. And I will say, too, that it's uh, something we do globally. And okay. so just, just for the audience to know, you know, our major offices that we work in are obviously here in the U.S. and in, in Canada, in the U.K., Germany, the Netherlands, Australia, and then Singapore and in Hong Kong. So it's really interesting to see how these compare and contrast on, on a global basis from an investor's perspective. I can imagine that is really interesting because, you know, some of the attitudes about investing and so forth and what you hope to accomplish from your investing experience is different here than it is in other parts of the country, right? Excuse me, other parts of the world, because, you know, some other countries have these, you know, as an example, like, you know, Australia has got these super annuation plan type experiences for retirement, whereas we don't have that type of stuff mm -hmm. here in the United States. And right, so your expectations for what does retirement look like that that one financial goal of retirement is going to look, I think, imagine, I can imagine dramatically different from one place to another. That, that's a natural I think approach you take to this is, and we hear it all the time, you know, you will present sort of the, the overall results and people will say, yeah, that's great, but, but it's here, it's different. You know, yeah. the investors here think about things differently and you're like, well, let's take a look at that. So you segment the data by that particular region and guess what you find? It's remarkable how similar people are on a global basis. People are people, uh, wherever they are, <laughs> people are people. And when it comes to investing and the emotions and things you're looking for, incredibly, incredibly consistent. So that, Dude, that's one of the I, major takeaways of the study itself. I love that you use the people as people. I literally just had this conversation with my wife last night. We were at a store. We, had, we're st we stopped on the way home. My daughter had a basketball game. We stopped like, oh, she's like, we'll slink through Costco and pick up some things or whatever. Like, okay, fine. There's something there. And um, the, the, the Costco, there, there's, there, this Costco is in a... Um, uh, a neighborhood that is heavily uh, Indian immigrant people. Uh, so, so a lot of the shoppers there were, you know, they're just different ethnic background. And we were walking by and this little kid was with his mom and she was trying to get him to get this snack or whatever. And she's like, mom, I'm going to hate those. And he's like flipping out. And all he started laughing. I'm like, little kids are little kids everywhere. It does not matter what your background <laughs> is. Little kids are the same. I just like lost my, lost it laughing. Cause like, you know, I've got two kids. A uh, minor 18 and 14, so you know, past the point of having tantrums in a, in a grocery, uh, grocery store or whatever. But it was like, it's exactly what you say. People are way more as the same than you think that is. And, and, and I, I'm glad to hear your data actually supports this. And it's not just Mike Langford's like observations in Costco. <laughs> well, and, and I'll, I'll give you a story. And I think maybe your audience will get a kick out of this uh, here in the U.S. anyway. And uh, it, actually, it's one of the findings that we see, too. Yeah. So I'll, I'll combine two and one. I was presenting these results a couple of years ago in London. 
And he was at an industry event. So we're kind of going through, here's what we found mm -hmm. from investors that participated in the study. And one of the, the attendees, she raised her hand and she goes, you know, I could see how in the US they would answer that question that way, but my clients would never ever answer it the way you just showed there. And the question was, hey, when you meet with your advisor, what is the number one thing that you wanna talk about? And you know, you ask the audience and they always say something defective. Well, I wanna see progress towards my goals or what's going on in the, in the current market environment. And the number one choice is I want to talk about my investments. Mm -hmm. And that's what this person was saying. Well, yeah, that makes sense in the U.S. because the advisors in the U.S., all they do is investments. They don't do financial planning. Mm -hmm. Here in the U.K., we do financial planning and investments. And so it was kind of funny because I had the, the data there that actually it was number one in the U.K. as well as Canada and Australia. And then I reminded her that actually pretty much every advisor in the U.S. does financial planning as well. I think what you find here in the U.S. is yeah. historically, traditionally, we've led with investments and right. then all the, the financial planning and retirement planning, everything comes with it. I think in some of these other countries, Commonwealth countries, a lot of times it's planning and then the investments follow. But the services are very, very consistent around the globe and the responses are very, very consistent around the globe from an investor's perspective. So that was one you know, quick yeah. story there of how people yeah. think, yeah, but it's just different here. And it, yeah. it really isn't. I think also from, not only from an investor perspective, but from the advisor's business, it's very consistent on a global basis as well. Yeah, and it totally makes sense too, when you think about it, right? Like, listen, if I'm your client, I'm bringing you my money. This is the money that I've, I've accumulated and I'm entrusting you with it. And, 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 and it's the fundamental crux of our relationship right now. Because if you mess that piece up, if that piece does underperforms or whatever, none of the goals we set matter. None of the financial planning ideas we discuss, like, hey, I brought you a million and now I only have 600,000. I'm not happy with this, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's just, you no, know, it makes sense that that is always going to be what you know, somebody's number one priority, unless they have some other like traumatic experience in their life where they have you know, a child who is injured or they have family that you have to take care of with other certain things. But in that case, investments matter too, right? Like do I have the money to be able to accomplish that goal? That's pretty fascinating. Well, I want to shift gears a tiny bit, just kind of thinking about like maybe how some things have changed over the years since you've been doing these types of studies. Um, you know, the in the advisor benchmarking study that Catherine and I discussed, that was the study was actually 2019 and she and I had the conversation in 2020, which feels like a million years ago, right about now, <laughs> yeah. you know, because yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it really does. I had to ask my people like, did the pandemic really start in 2020? Or is like, you know, I was, I'm trying to figure out like, it just feels like a haze, right? Like life has really dramatically changed a lot or we feel yeah, like it has. I know advisors, yeah. I know advisors think like many of the fundamentals of their business haven't changed too much in the past few years, but I, you know, I think they have. I think we've heard a lot of feedback like, oh, I, you know, the way I do business, where I do business has changed from advisors. And I suspected many of the investors uh, think the same way, you know, by extension. So many of them have some different expectations of their advisors. What have been the biggest changes that you and the team have seen in recent years from the investor perspective, like what they expect or what they need from their, their advisor relationship? From, from the investor's perspective. Yeah, um, from the investor's perspective. Yeah. If they've started the voice yeah. like, hey, life's different now, or you know, new priorities have bubbled up because of what I just went through over these last couple of years. You know, I'll, I think I'll, I'll give it a, an opinion, some thoughts around that mm -hmm. question. You know, that's just jumping into my mind here. And then I'll also address it with some of the things that we found in the study where we actually have some some data around that. And I think that pandemic, and I'm with you, I go back to, well, it's just a couple of years ago. Well, I, I, in our mind, it's two, three years ago, and it's really like five to seven years ago. It's yeah, just, yeah. that just seems to be the way it's, it's sort of been yeah. lately. But it, it's a really good question because you think through, hey, what was that experience that we're all trying to deliver going into the pandemic? Obviously, that hit, that, that changed things in a very significant way. And what I think that did for many of us, I think that did it for dimensional in the way we work with advisors. I think it did it for advisors in the way they work with their clients is, I think it gave you a lot more comfort and confidence to say, you know, let's try something new. You know, we were forced into this totally different way of uh, interacting, communicating, and it worked. And so I think there's an expectation of, I think it's okay 
to go out there and try maybe a new way to communicate. Maybe we try a little bit of virtual, but in person, or maybe we can do it in a little bit different place, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff and how we do it. So I think he gives you a little leeway to, to experiment with some things. So I think that's good. One of the questions that we did ask in the last study, you know, is, okay, going forward, you know, how do you want to interact uh, with your mm -hmm. advisor? Because I think it was probably, you know, maybe six years ago or so we asked that question in both the advisor and the investor study of, you know, how do you want to interact with your advisor, you know, in person, on the phone, virtual. And, and virtual was like 8%. Like it just yeah. didn't really cross too many people's minds. Some advisors were doing it and very, very effectively. And there were huge advocates of it, you know, like five years before the pandemic. Yeah. Pandemic hit. And so then we asked a, a similar type question. And, you know, one of the questions we say is, well, how many times do you want to speak with your advisor? Yeah. And the answer on average was about 3.8. So that's speak to, it's not just me, but speak to. And then we asked, okay, as a follow-up, what does that mean? And about half of that was a, a virtual interaction and half was in person. So there's still an appetite to get together in person, but probably less than it used to be. I think now the, the efficiency yeah. of virtual is just so advantageous for both, both sides yeah. of it. And people are very comfortable with it. I think what that does though, are a couple of things is, if you're interacting virtually now and there are charts you're trying to show them or maybe some different graphics or you're trying to keep their attention, you better be incredibly dialed in on how effective you are at that, what tools you're using, because in some cases they're on their, their phone, right? And they're yeah. not going to see whatever page you're holding up or whatever you're trying to share with them. So, you know, it's, you got to really spend the time to think through this and deliver a proper experience for that. Know your backgrounds, know your camera angles. You know, that's all part of the client experience. That stuff, yeah. that stuff matters. I'm just like what we were doing, you know, on, on this one, you got to get that stuff right. The other thing I think that's coming into play, and this is something that, again, you have to be very thoughtful about how you're communicating with clients is, and this is really societal, you think about our attention now, and our time, there is so mm. much competition for our time and I think our mental energy now in society right. today. And so the fact that, okay, I am gonna make a couple hours available for my advisor, that's getting harder and harder, I think, to come across. And so when you have those couple hours, there's probably so many more distractions now, whether you're virtually, maybe they got a phone in front of them, stuff like that. So what are you gonna do to make sure you maximize that hour to get the points you're trying to get across, establish a relationship and the rapport with the client, make sure they're hearing what yeah. you're saying, most importantly, make sure you're hearing what they're saying yeah. and what they want to talk about. So I think you just got to get really, really clear and dialed in on, on uh, how you're going to have those effective communications. I think the other part of this, and then, and, and I'll stop here too, is the expectation for a response for something is so immediate now, you know, and by that, by that, I mean, the, the ease of doing things. So this is where, you know, you see it with advisors. And I think they're doing a very nice job with these kind of things where they, the, the ability to, to book a meeting, the ability to go online, whether it's to book your haircut or book a meeting with your advisor, like you want to be able to click a button and do it right then. Like I don't want to pick up my yeah. phone and have to be on hold and wait to do that stuff. We need instant responses to this. And, and you mentioned your kids. I've got kids in their early 20s. I see it with them where they're like, yo, hey, dad, check this out. And they show their phone and click on something. If it doesn't pop up in a second, they're, they're literally like, okay, well, we'll, you know, never mind. And they put the phone down. Like there's just not yeah. the patience for those yeah. kind of things in communication anymore. And, and so you got to be real thoughtful how you're going to make sure they're, they're hearing what you want to say. I, I love the points that you just made there and, 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 and to kind of uh, echo what you're talking about, you know, the, the need for being adept at if you're going to have digital communication, so if you're going to be using Zoom or some other tool to hold your client meeting, you had better get good at holding their attention. And, and I say that because, hey, listen, we've all been on a webinar. And you're lying if when the webinar is going on, you're not kind of like poking around on the website, checking your email, doing other <laughs> things other than paying attention to the webinar, right? That's, that's why we decided, you know, all the webinars that we produce, we decided to do them a little bit differently and make them more conversational, actually have the, 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 the guest and the moderator on like, speaking because like you lose somebody's attention when they're just looking at slides. And if, if they know you can't see them, they're out. <laughs> so I love they're the fact the that dog. you're- 
you know, yeah. eating cereal. I mean, you know that stuff's going on. <laughs> we all do it, right? You're watching the football game. You ever you ever call somebody and you know that they're watching TV and they're not paying attention to you? So that's happening. So you do, you want their, I love the, the, the notion of that you really want to make sure you grab their attention and get adept at this. Like, how can I make sure that this is a vibrant and meaningful engagement with the client? Because at the end of the day, it is a relationship business. You want to make sure that you can yep. maintain that. And you can do that on these types of things. But you got you to, gotta, be skilled at it. Uh, so it just takes some practice and, and kind of noticing what works and what doesn't work. And, and I, I love the other thing that you mentioned, the immediacy expectation, right? The, the convenience and immediacy of interaction or, or feedback on something. Heck, you know, it goes down to like texting somebody. If, if you haven't shut off, like, you know, read receipts on your, on your text. So people know that, A, you got it and that you've looked at it. And so now there's enough like, Hey, when's Mark getting back to me? I, I know he read this thing, right? I want to know when I'm going to get a response. And so your point is really apt, right? Like they, you now some of this you could build in, right? You could do things like add schedulers to your, to your website. So somebody can book a meeting with you with ease without actually having to go back and forth with 20 different emails and those types of things. But uh, give some thought to, or at least get good at setting expectations. Like I have a 24 hour turnaround time or something like that especially on the weekends for, for something. <laughs> yeah, <they're really> <laughs> well, in, you know, where I think that ties into as well is, you know, just going back to that sort of the engagement and the attention span of, I, I think the world we're in now is, I mean, we, we like to use this, this term, you know, the customization, both okay. we're seeing it in the investment solutions, right? The, the, and that's been pretty quick the last four or five years of you're seeing a real true attempt to customize investment solutions for clients. Maybe, you know, mutual funds are appropriate for one client, maybe some SMAs for another. Now, more that, that idea of a hey, one size model doesn't fit everybody anymore. There's got to be a much more thoughtful customization and convenience around it. Right. But then I think on that client experience, it applies too, where you know, you you think, well, I write a newsletter, right? Is that appropriate for all of my clients? I don't know anymore because again, mm. if people look at something and say, Yeah, it's not really of my interest, they click it off or don't even read it, yet maybe there's something very impactful in there later on. And so one of the things we saw in that investor study, Mike, you mentioned is how do you, how do you measure the value of your relationship with mm -hmm. your advisor? And, you know, is it investment returns? Is it they know me? Things like that. And, and the number one choice consistently over the years has been peace of mind mm. around that. But if you look at it then and break it out a little bit demographically between ages, you see, you know, the older folks, it's absolutely about peace of mind. But you start yeah. to see this idea of progress towards goals creeping up there in some of the younger ages, uh, which makes total sense, right? Because that's <laughs> that's where they're at yeah. in life, you know, with their yeah. kids, and that's what they're working towards. A lot of the, the, the higher number of clients, the advisors we work with are certainly more in that older retirement age. So they're, they're there. Now it's just sort yeah. of keeping it in, in, in the peace of mind around that. So that's where I go back to your form of communication. You know, if you're just talking about things that are relevant to perhaps a retiree, you may lose a third of your audience uh, on that stuff. So it doesn't make sense to start customizing multiple newsletters. Well, you know, that takes time and energy. Writing's difficult, but you got to figure that stuff out, I think, now for this more customized, I'll, I'll say tailored client experience uh, to where you can still do it at scale. You know, you, you take... Oh, that's such a profound point thinking about you may have to customize and personalize your, your digital communication because if that's the way you're going to be interacting with the client, it's, it's going to be a little bit different and nuanced than the, the way it was before. Because, you know, we think about the world of an advisor pre pandemic and let's go, let's even go further back seven, eight years ago. Right. So before zoom became ubiquitous in, in companies, Broker deals and RAAs were, were comfortable allowing advisors to use video chat for things. All of your relationships were basically in person and maybe on the phone for the most part, right? And you, and you had some print and so forth. But for the most part, you were going to actually talk to somebody and you, the foundation of the relationship was built first in person for the advisor and the client. But now we're entering a new world in which it's very likely that some of the relationships that a client starts with their advisor or some, assuming with the advisor starts with their clients are going to be digital first and maybe digital only. And I wonder if you're seeing some change in behavior on the advisor's behalf in recognition of that, because I can imagine like 
one thing that pops in my mind immediately is I am much more likely to be loyal and sticky with somebody I have an in-person relationship with than I am if I just kind of clicked a few things and we've chatted with each other online. If I decide that I'm going to leave, so like, is I mean, are we expecting attrition rates to change dramatically for advisors? Because if you've never actually met one-on-one with me, it's not that painful for me to switch to somebody else. I don't have to like look you in the eye and go, sorry, Mark, I'm leaving you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think you're onto something with that question. I'm I'm one of those that believe in person still matters quite a bit in, in a variety yeah. of different ways. But you know, I'll go back to the first part of your question and we we're talking about some folks that used to do largely virtual even before several years before kind of was a thing with the pandemic. And you, you talk to them and they would say, I can't believe more people aren't doing this because it's mm. such an efficient way to run your business. And I, I think the key goes back to that of setting proper expectations with a prospect mm. as they're coming in, because what this advisor that's coming to mind would say is, hey, listen, here's, here's how, uh, and, and they, he, he would meet locally, certainly in the city he lived in mm. with clients for sure. But if they lived out of the city, you know, he wouldn't spend the time to go travel just because it, right. you know, it's time, so time intensive. And so for those folks that, were coming in that lived outside the, the state he worked in, he would say, no, listen, here's just how this is relationships going to set up. If you're comfortable with doing kind of a virtual type relationship, fantastic. Um, if you're not, that's okay too. But, you know, just from a scalable perspective and a business perspective, I won't be making trips out there. And almost all the, the prospects said, yeah, it works totally fine. And, you know, half his clients were virtual that way. And, mm -hmm. and I asked the question to him, you know, well, did you see a, a differential in your referral rates that you were getting between in-person, let's say more local clients versus yeah. somebody that was virtual? He says, no, no difference. Same referral rates, whether in, in a lot of those virtuals, I've never met them in person before after several years. So it yeah. can be done. It can be done very effectively if you just set the right expectations around that. Now, with that said, I still think there's, there's magic to being in person. It just yeah. enhances, I think, what you could probably do virtually. That's just sort of my opinion and my experiences around it. Yeah. Yeah. It'll, it'll be interesting to see how it evolves, right? Because again, you have a, a and it's not even just one demographic, right? Like you've, you've got a, a new populace that some, has been shaped by the tools that we've been given and some tools we're forced to use because of a, a short period of timeline where we couldn't be in person, where people are very comfortable talking virtually. Like I, I, my parents, my goodness. They prefer to text me than talk to me on the phone. They just, uh, when did that happen? And it happened really quick. All of a sudden, it's just like they'd rather call me, uh, text me to say, even stuff to them like, isn't this a phone call conversation? I'm getting like texts from my parents about that type of stuff. So, uh, demographically, I don't think it matters in terms of an age bracket anymore. So, it's definitely some stuff to be uh, mindful of. Let's shift gears a little hey, bit. Can I just mention one thing around that? Oh, and then we can move on. Yeah, and Absolutely. And again, I, I just want to be very clear, you know, virtual is here to stay for sure. Oh, for and sure. I think it's a very effective. It's just, you know, maybe there's some ways you just want to think about enhancing it with, with some in person. Yeah. But going back to the comment about older folks, uh, and that goes back to this advisor I was, I was mentioning earlier, he would say that, you know, everyone thinks that it's the older folks that aren't really capable with technology. He goes, my experience has been the opposite. They're very comfortable mm -hmm. virtual because that's how they interact with their grandkids so often. So the idea of FaceTime yeah. and being there, they're no issues with it. They're very good at For logging sure. in and dialing in. So just, you know, we, we sort of have our biases at times, but again, yeah, you know, I wouldn't always trust him. Just make sure you reach out to clients and know what their perspectives are and how they want to interact. It's really probably as simple as that. Well, and, and frankly, it's like if, if you're, if you're starting to get into an older part of your life, you may not want to drive to an advisor's office. You may not want to have to worry about hosting them at your home, right? Cause like there certain things become more challenging as you get older. And so embracing digital technology, which has been made easier and easier. It's not like, you know, clicking talk via FaceTime on your, on your iPad is all that difficult, right? If we can, we could do this type of stuff. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's not going anywhere. And in fact, it's going to accelerate. And I think it's, you know, up to the advisors to embrace it in a way that it continues to have strong relationships with their clients, right? To foster strong relationships with their clients. Um, well, okay, so let's let's shift gears to this other. This is an area that you and your team are particularly passionate about, and I'm really excited to learn more about. And I purposely only skimmed information on this, so I wouldn't come in like knowing all the answers. So, <laughs> <laughs> in our prep call, you mentioned your Dimensional 360 program, 
and described it as a program that helps you be as successful as you can be. I, I think I paraphrased it correctly for the way that you, you, you mentioned it. So before we dive into the details of the program, and I do want to hear a lot about it, let's define success because that's different for everybody, I think, because the, the nuances are going to matter here. So the framework that you hit on, on the uh, Dimensional 360 program, it says, number one, investments, communication, and then number three, strategy. But let's start with like, what is success? And then we can dive into all those types of deals. Actually, you, you phrased it really, really well. And, and I like to use a similar type of language, which is you know, what all this is designed to do, this you know, tools and resources is to help advisors be as successful as they want to be. And we say that because uh, success does mean different things to different people. Mm -hmm. You know, some firms absolutely just, they want to grow revenue. And that's totally fine. Others say, I have a wonderful lifestyle business, and I just want to keep that going. Others say, hey, I have, I want to solve some succession. And if I can get some of the mm -hmm. ownership down into next gen, that's success. So some of these major initiatives are in how sex success is defined is very different by firms. So. Uh, with that said, then, you know, that's what we want to do to design yeah. a support structure that can be flexible, can be very modular, depending yeah. on what what the advisor is is trying to achieve there. So it, it, it's hard to say what success is because it's it's there at the yeah. individual firm level. Now, you did a good job with your, your notes there, a uh, good memory there of kind of laying it out of what Dimensional 360 is, uh, which there are those three major pillars. It's the investments, the communications, and, and strategy. As you mentioned there, and you know, we we think about that almost in terms of a chronology, in terms mm -hmm. of the relationship that we've had with advisors. Which you know, for us, it's generally the investment solution uh, that, that draws advisors into working with Dimensional. And then from there, it's say, hey, I love what you do on the investment side, but it's a very unique investment approach. You know, this idea, the way you use uh, prices and making decisions around differences in returns and securities, the way you implement, how it's different than than indexing. It's not really traditional stock picking. So how do mm -hmm. I talk about dimensional? How do I communicate some of these ideas and investment philosophy? What resources do you have for me? So that, that's sort of how it developed out communications over time. And then we found that, hey, if you got a great investment solution, you can articulate it well with clients, you are going to have business success. Mm -hmm. And what do you need to do to be able to think about your business as a business? And for a lot of advisors out there, you know, they got into the business out of the love of the investments, the planning, taking care yeah. of clients. And of course, they, they do that well, and they're good at it. Now they're going to have success. And now all of a sudden, you got this complexity of, man, I got to manage a bunch of people. I got to deal with operations. I got to deal with compliance. How am I going to train and develop all these great, talented people I've hired? So it gets, it gets complex pretty quickly yeah. there. And so that, that's where we built this out around those uh, major pillars, just to help each firm, depending on what they're trying to accomplish. I love it. I love it. It's, it is true. It's like, you know, I say it almost every single episode of this show is that, you know, most advisors, the ones who've been here for 20, 30 years, right, which are your mature advisory businesses, you know, they got their start as stockbrokers before they were called financial advisors, right? So <laughs> they, they answered a call probably somewhere to basically, hey, become a stockbroker. And, and they, they learned how to sell. They probably, very similar to what you see in the movies, a list of names <laughs> was dropped on a desk and says, hey, listen, you're going to train for the Series 7. While you're doing that, you're also going to call these phone numbers and they're going to introduce them to a senior rep. And da, 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 da. So their life evolved that way. And then now you know, we've added, to your point, complexity in the way that you do business. It is not just selling investment products. It is now developing relationships and helping clients with their financial goals. As you mentioned, most advisors now are doing some form of financial planning for their clients. So it's growing a lot. So I love the fact that you're saying, hey, listen, we need to recognize this You know, here at Dimensional. We need to help advisors navigate this journey because if they're going to be as successful as they want to be, and I love that you called out lifestyle business being okay, because a lot of absolutely people. yeah great lifestyle yeah. dude you make you know a lot of money and you play a lot of golf or whatever it is you like to do <laughs> there's nothing <laughs> well, wrong with that but and you're taking good care of clients too yeah you know it, it's great there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and that's the beauty of the industry is serving clients well mm -hmm. they're having great experiences you're having a nice life experience good business experience sure. that, that's a great model nothing wrong with that yeah, yeah. and you it, but you just have to make sure you have the right tools there to ensure that that lifestyle maintains. So, so I was talking about like, there's a lot of good value here in the industry 
to help advisors maintain that lifestyle business and not have it, you know, uh, shrink as they, as they age yep. and their clients age with them, right. To make sure, Hey, listen, everybody's going to have some form of attrition and whether that attrition comes because clients uh, die, divorce, or leave you, or they start consuming their assets. They get into a new phase of their life where they're no longer, they're into the net, net redemption category and they're not just seeing things grow. How are you going to maintain your lifestyle if that type of thing happens? You have to have a plan to in place and so forth. I can go on forever about this. It's one of my passion projects. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right. How do you replenish the pipeline? You know, yeah. and referrals are still an incredibly effective way to do that. I think the other thing too, and, and you're really seeing this come into play, the, you know, there's a responsibility to your clients to make sure that there's some form of succession. And mm -hmm. even if you're, you're a sole owner of, of a business, the sole advisor, I should say, you're still having something in place there. If something happened, yeah. you know, the clients will be well taken care of in, in this particular situation. So yeah, that, that's something you, I think one of your earlier questions is sort of what are you seeing within the, yeah. the industry going on? And of course, everybody knows succession. Uh, is a massive topic, whether there's some sort of a deal around that, or maybe just getting ownership down into your employees. It, yeah. It's something that's been around a long time, but I feel like now it's real, <laughs> so to speak, in the sense that those folks have been talking about it for 10 years, they're just now 10 years older, and we know the demographics around a lot of the owners and founders yeah. of these these firms. And then, of course, the valuation has been something that's just, it's just hard not to talk about yeah. these things. And again, you have to do it for taking care of your clients and your employees, too. So that's been front and center and we can dive into that as much as you'd like. Oh yeah. As I mean, well. Succession is so key. I mean, I think the pandemic threw it into stark relief, how important succession is and emergency continuity plans are because, you know, the, the pandemic was particularly harsh on older folks. The older you were, the more potentially lethal the disease was. And well, we, we hear all the time that the average age of a financial advisor is like 62. Well, you know, th if that's the average age, guess what? There's on the one side of that bell curve is people who are older than 62 and some of them significantly older than 62. So they were susceptible. So like, what happens to you and your, your, your client's welfare if all of a sudden you were hit by an illness or the proverbial, uh, We've actually changed the phrase here. It used to be hit by a bus. What if you're hit by an Uber? You know, it's what we say. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, but uh, no, it's true. I, I think deservedly so. We should be shining some light on this type of stuff. And this is actually a great segue into the next topic about the about multi generational businesses or in the, in the shift in, in generations. Because one of the things I've talked about on this show a lot, and I, and I think you and I might have talked about it in prep, is this is a, a relatively new profession. We're, we still have the first generation of financial advisors working. You know, some of them have retired, but like we still have Gen 1s, right? Uh, as I just Absolutely. mentioned, they used to be called stockbrokers and now they're called financial advisors. So, uh, how, however, right now, which is really interesting, we are seeing the third generation and maybe even the fourth generation of advisors in the early stages of their, their journey as, as a... And that raises a, a couple of really interesting questions that I got to credit to you because you, you kind of teed these up in the prep call. I love it. Uh, number one is how is G1 and G2 advisors, how are they going to adapt to a more complex businesses? Like, again, we've talked about some of this digital stuff and the world is changing. And then number two, how do G3 and G4 advisors develop their presence with high net worth clients? I love that. that so I want, I want to hit both of these. So let's dive in first. How are, how are you seeing the 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 original, the OG advisors adapting to a new complex environment. What, what are you seeing uh, that that's working for them? Oh, well, a couple of things come to mind there. And, and, and we talked about that a little bit earlier. You know, they get into the, the profession, love of the profession, do it well, have success. And then you, you start seeing them and you're talking to them and they say, okay, I'm growing and I've never been more frustrated in my life because now mm -hmm. I'm spending all my time doing this or that. And, you know, one just comes to mind, I think they're about a $500 million firm at the time. And you know, one of the partners just said, I'd never been more miserable and we're having the most success mm. we've ever had. And he goes, if I have to do more operational type stuff, you know, I'm, I'm just going to have to think about the industry as a whole. I'm like, well, it sounds to me like you need a dedicated head of operations. And you know, yeah. that's about the time in the growth of a lot of these firms where you see you start getting in where you've been a generalist now you got to get real specialized and go to where your skill sets are. So you bring in somebody to run operations and 
you know, it frees them up to go do the things that they enjoy. Mm. The operational person will do the stuff that they're good at and enjoy doing. And so that's sort of part of that G1, I think, the G2 evolution a little bit around that. I think it's part of that growth where it gets a little complicated and challenging too is having a, a real honest, uh, I guess, assessment of, you know, the people you had in place that got you to a certain size of a firm, or are they the ones that still can get you to that next level? You know, maybe they got you to 500 million to a billion. Can they get you to 5 billion? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, and it's okay if it's not, it's just, you can, you know, direct them to where their skill sets are best suited for the organization and maybe yeah. find where you have some gaps. So I think those are a couple of things to, to jump out from that. And then obviously you have the ownership issues there and yeah. we will, we'll, we'll dive into that one here in just a minute but what we've seen too and i know you've talked about this on your show of you now you these firms have success and so you bring in you hire new advisors to help you out with the business you know and then the expectation is well <laughs> these guys go get some business yeah. and like well you hired me as a service advisor not to go get new business and do business development so i think there's always been some tension around that over the years but it kind of gets to that your, your your point there to me of that next generation then yeah of you know what what being very clear about the expectations what do you want these up and coming and next gen advisors to do from a client facing perspective and how do you get them trained to be effective in doing that whether it's servicing or business development and one of the things that we you know we we talk about that middle middle pillar of dimensional 360 which is that communication and we were doing a workshop with a, a pretty big firm multi billion dollar firm last year and all the client facing people were in their room and and we built out I, I think a very effective framework for communications when you think about we call it the 4s framework but it's right. the script you know what are the things you want to say yeah. how you can use storytelling effectively what can you draw a sketch we like to yeah. call it and then supplements which are hey so what are some of those supporting materials and you know each one of those can be very effective in engaging a client in, in you know trying to communicate some various aspects to them but as we were talking about this room you know we we asked the question you know how many of you use these things in your meetings about half the room raised their hands and said yeah we do yeah. consistently well who are those people that raise their hands it's probably those over 50 years old right mm -hmm. so eventually you figure this stuff out you do thousands of meetings you eventually figure out what works now could you do some training to where, hey, with these younger folks then, and I say younger, meaning somewhere between, you know, coming out of school, undergrad to maybe it's mid 30s, somewhere around in there. Okay. You yeah. know, instead of now learning it over two, 3,000 meetings and getting really good at it, can you, can you do some training and shorten that up to, you know, two, 300 meetings and become yeah. very effective? You know, if you're a 28 year old, you're not running around with the $5 million people too often, $5 million of, yeah. of uh, AUM, you know, so, uh, what kind of training can you do to have? I like to use the word presence, mm. where you're trying to establish credibility with somebody. Let's say you're again 28 and you're you're talking to a 60 year old couple with five million bucks. You know, you, you try to establish credibility. And you probably go to the the aspect of, well, let me just show you how smart I am, how much knowledge I have. Yeah. You know, it's, and you know that may not always be the right approach. You know, there's other ways to probably engage with that particular couple so that's that's what we think we can do a lot with this younger generation to help them in, yeah. in their own training and development around that so so important mark i tell you I've, I've told this story i think once or twice on this show and 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 I've, I've many times over the years one of my favorite favorite things to do when i speak at an advisor conference is i like to go to like the cocktail party or whatever the night before you know and and mix and mingle with the advisors that are there cuz i i typically speak at like top producer events and things like that right and so I, I like to ask them how many years were you in the business before you felt successful like when did you feel like you got this the business and more often than not the most common answer is 5 years right so like they it's just it's it takes a while to get your sea legs under you to develop some of those things like you said like sketching things out or whatever having your stories that work that you, you you're testing things out as a as a person but what's frightening is i saw the stat and i can't remember exactly where i pulled it from but it was it was for finra registered advisors and it said 85% new finra advisors don't make it to year 5 they wash out by year four. So in other words, we are hiring 
an amazing amount of people into this industry who quit before they get to year five. But what I'm saying, now this is anecdotal, maybe you want to throw this into your study, is I know that if you get to year five, that compounding effect of all the, the reps you've had and the client, the small clients you've had and, and, and that refer the new clients and, and they start to add new assets or whatever, you start to feel like you have escape velocity in year five. So the stuff that you're talking about is so important for this industry. Like, how do we get the newer advisors or whether they were fresh out of college or they're a 32 year old, you know, a early career changer or whatever, mm -hmm. how do we help them accelerate to get to the point where they feel comfortable and confident that this is a viable career for them? Cause we know what's ahead of them. So uh, anyways, that's my little, Oh boy, know, that's a drink induced rant. <laughs> super important point. And you know, you know, it was funny when you, it what jumped out to me, you said, you know, it kind of takes five years to get their legs under them to where they're feeling effective. Yeah. Those must be super talented people. I was just even yeah. thinking for me and my band, that's got it. It takes a, it takes a while. Yeah. So, you know, you're ready to go and you can respond to almost in any environment. I would have gone well more than five. So they must be uh, very talented, but you know, it's, well, yeah, it's a really producers. sad. Maybe that's <laughs> yeah. Well, that's probably, but there you go. Yeah. You're the, the best of the best, but it, it's a really sad statistic, isn't it? Yeah. That people will blow out of the industry before five years because it can be such an incredibly rewarding industry for people. And it is a very rewarding industry yeah. for people. And you know, that's something I think we all need to keep thinking about is how do you get more awareness around what this can be for, you know, folks coming up through college and make it a very rewarding profession just to get greater volume of yeah. people coming in. But what you're touching on, I think in, in, for now, I'm going to go for the younger folks. We can talk perhaps about the career changers here in a minute, but people coming out of college, what we do know and you've probably seen it with your kids, we've seen it with mine, and certainly the hires we've had here at Dimensional is, you know, they do care deeply about their, their development and, and their training and development. They want to have an understanding around, you know, what does career development look like? Mm -hmm. And I think, what, in fact, one of the things that uh, we had, uh, we had a, somebody, a guy named Darren Roberts, he's a professor here at uh, University of Texas, uh, at UT. And he started a really interesting class years ago. He has a, a fantastically interesting background. He was in the NFL as a coach for a while. And then he got in and started a class there at UT, which was designed to you know, help develop leadership among athletes. And then over the years, it's become, I think, one of the top third most popular class at UT. And it's about developing leadership skills you know, for, for young folks. But one of the things he said, because I asked him the question, you know, all of us, we get old. And we do the, well, back in my day, you know, I, I walked through the snow and this and that. And, you know, and, and uh, so I asked the question, are they really different? Or is that just more in our mind or, or what we're seeing here in these younger people coming out of college really different? Mm -hmm. And his, his comment was, you know, I've been teaching this class about eight years. And he goes, what I don't think they're too much different than us, except they will hold you accountable. They don't have the patience that we had, you know, where we were kind of coming, we got a job, we just kind of wait, wait, wait. And he goes, they're not that patient. He goes, if you tell them this is what we stand for as, as a company, sort of our mission. And if they don't see it pretty quickly early mm -hmm. on, they're very quick to make a change. Or that you said, this is what my development, my career would look like. And if it's not developing at the speed of which was communicated to them, at least if they understood it, you know, they're pretty quick to make a change. So I just thought that was an interesting perspective from somebody who's been involved in that very closely for eight so years, because I think important. it ties into your point there around that five years, if whatever their expectation is, if coming in, this is, I guess, a FINRA to a licensed experience, something wasn't met right. in what they were looking for, or at least communicated to them. So I think we all got to get better about setting proper expectations. And it doesn't mean you accelerate them to a program. No. It's just, you're very clear to say, it's going to take you these many of years to be really good at these particular skill sets to get you to the next level. And if we lay that out, I think they can hold us accountable to train them yeah. properly, but they have to understand there's a real progression here. You have to get to a certain point to deliver the experience that your organization would expect for their clients. Well, and you know, it's so important to, to kind of highlight, you know, to build on what you're saying there, like to recognize that there is a war for talent out there. And you know, we've talked about like every, go drive by any place here in Austin where, where we are, there's, there's a help wanted sign up there. And now look, your financial advisor is not looking to go work at, you know, Dairy Queen or whatever. However, 
The other advisory firms around, around town would gladly take your advisor off you who's already been licensed and is ready to rock and roll if they're not feeling fulfilled. So it's not even just about people quitting and, and exiting the industry. It's like, there's a war for talent. It, smart people have options. Ambitious people have options. And that is true in our industry, just like it is in the tech space and, and others. So treat your people well, but also make sure that they're getting what they want out of the relationship or you do risk losing it. Well, and that's where, you know, we, we, again, part of that communication pillar for us is, yeah, part of it is to say, hey, here's some resources and content and things like that you can go use with, with your clients. Mm -hmm. Because the whole goal of that is, instead of a bunch of advisors, I like to say, messing around with PowerPoint, if we can give them yeah. some things that are high quality, they can go spend more time with clients, which is what's going to grow the business for and sure. most important. But the other part of that is, you know, a lot of these organizations, they're just not at the scale or size to be able to provide a full on effective training program for people. So that's something that a lot of our clients have been able to leverage. The things we learned over yeah. the years is we're growing, you know, I always say here at Dimensional, we're very similar to an advisory firm. You know, we care deeply about clients. We want to deliver a great experience. We're trying to find talent, hire them uh, and develop them and train them. We just have a different scale, perhaps yeah. than <laughs> advisor yeah, right. firms, but it's still the things you're trying to accomplish and grow as an organization. So yeah. we just try to take the things we learned over time and go out that and, and offer it up to our clients. Well, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why I love having folks like yourself on the show, right? Is that you are, you have the bigger resources, you have the knowledge and, and you've actually taken the time to go out and study the industry, whether it's looking at the advisors or the, the, or the, the investors, and, and you can have this macro viewpoint, right? But you can bring it down to, the, to an individual advisor level as well. And so it's actually a wonderful resource for individual advisors, but all of us in the industry to, to learn from that. So I really, really appreciate it. That being said, I know we're basically just about out of time, but I wanna hit you with my one last question, which I, I love this. Because of that macro view that you have and the unique perspective and how many advisors you're able to talk to, are you seeing anything bubbling up below the surface that maybe hasn't hit the kind of, let's call it cultural zeitgeist yet for, for advisors that we can be on the lookout for? Like, hey, be mindful. There's a new trend coming that you may want to think about. Bubbling up. You know, you know I'll tell you what comes to mind on that. Um... There's been a move here in the U.S. for the last several years. You know, obviously the consolidation, you're seeing a lot of these firms going up and buying up, the big companies buying up a lot of advisors, certainly that's self-succession for, for many firms. And you're just getting these big, big, bigger firms. You're seeing it also with maybe some of the various asset managers or custodians that are getting into offering advice. And that's something that we haven't done. You know, we... We, we don't want to compete with our, our clients, rather we support them. But I mentioned that because it's interesting to see how in the U.S. it's it's kind of moving towards this vert vertically integrated entire mm. solution of custody to advice to investment solutions. And yet you go to, say, Australia, for example, and, and they had that in place. And over the last five years, that has completely been unwound. Part of it was regulatory requirements because they're starting to see a bunch of conflicts coming into play. So. I mentioned that to say it's it's very interesting to see how things ebb and flow yeah. over time. And you know, you mentioned the stockbrokers earlier. You know, it used to be yeah. th th these big warehouses with stockbrokers and there's this move to independent advisors where they have their own company and now you're seeing a bunch of these consolidators come in and buy up a bunch of these firms. So yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that that unfolds over time. To where you know these large firms does a young up and coming talent stay there or do they go start their own firms yeah over time that that's what's going to be super interesting to me in the next five seven years i love it i love that that notion of like hey we get we get big and then we get small again they just keep like it keeps doing that right just as we get big because maybe for safety or or like you said for succession reasons and then at some point in time when the next generation of advisors are there like you know what would be awesome if i had my own small boutique firm i think i'll break away and go do like so i wonder if that'll just kind of keep being a cycle every you know decade or so you see like expand contract expand contract type of deal very very cool well yeah. mark this has been fantastic stuff i really appreciate you carving out the time to come on the show and share all your insights um, people are going to absolutely want to follow up and learn more. What's the best way for people to follow up with you individually and then uh, Dimensional more broadly, I guess, is Dimensional.com. But uh, how, how about the stuff that you're working on? How can people follow along with that? Oh, geez. Well, me individually. 
Uh, happy to talk to uh, anybody interested. Mark Gochner, Dimensional.com, obviously our website, Dimensional.com. There's a whole bunch of Dimensional folks all around LinkedIn, <laughs> yeah, like, like everybody there. Um, but it's just something, you know, again, going back to, uh, it's just such a fantastic industry. Anything we can do to help an advisor think about their business, whether it's, hey, they're looking for, you know, more efficient investment solutions or business solutions, be happy to, happy to talk to them. Um, we can talk about Perfect. this stuff all day long. Sounds great. Well, thank you very much for being on the show, Mark. Great having you here. All right. Mike, a lot of fun. Thank you. Yep. See ya. Thank you very much for listening to and or watching this episode of the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. It's always fantastic to have you with us. Huge thanks to Mark Gochner from DFA for carving out the time to share some of the great insights that he and his team have compiled. I love how DFA and the advisors and their clients who participated in the survey are so generous with their experiences. It really makes a difference when we all contribute to improving the industry. All right. As I mentioned at the top of the show, please make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. And if you haven't done so already, give this episode a share on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you hang out online. Chances are, if you found it interesting, so will people in your network. So be generous. Share this stuff out. Just like those advisors and the clients who shared with DFA and DFA shared with the world. Just share the good stuff, okay? And I like to think this is good stuff. All right. That's it for today. As always, be nice to each other. We'll see you next time on the Modern Financial Advisor Podcast. See ya. Bye.